I can't. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. My name is Brian Jones. Um, I'm a software engineer. And um, hi, hi. <laughs> thanks. I'm super duper nervous. Uh, so uh, thanks. Uh, I was. Um, I'm a PSF member now since uh, right after the last PyCon. I'm a software engineer. I work uh, right now for Aweber Communications. Before that, it was myyearbook.com. I've worked for uh, addthis.com before they were bought out. Um, I've worked in startups, government, academia, uh, so I have a pretty uh, broad-based background. I co-authored Linux Server Hacks for O'Reilly in 2005, and I'm working with David Beasley now on the third edition of the Python cookbook. Um, I'm BK Jones on GitHub. I'm Jonesy on Freenode. Uh, joined the Python testing IRC channel. We have great discussions in there, but it's relatively low traffic. And uh, my blog is protocolostomy.com. Uh, all the content there is technical. And the ads are hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about um, some definitions. And I want to let you know that I'm bastardizing some of the definitions for the context of this talk, because um, I've made some assumptions about the audience. And I'm sure that there's a, a broader array of people than I could possibly target in one talk. Um, but so I'm, I'm going to use definitions that sometimes fly in the face of uh, the literature, quote unquote. We're going to talk about some, some patterns. When I talk about patterns, I'm not talking about design patterns. I'm talking about um, practical patterns that you actually see in code out in the wild. Um, unit tests are sort of by definition low level. And so the patterns that we're going to be looking at are also low level. And design patterns are more high level. And then we'll talk about some tools as well. I am not going to give you an intro to the unit test module. Um, I kind of assume that uh, everyone has at least seen it before. Number one, number two. If you haven't, it would take you all of it would take you probably less than an hour to write a, a reasonably sane-looking um, uh, test suite using the unit test module. If you just use the documentation, <laughs> I'm also not going to give you a sales pitch for doing testing at all. If you're here, I assume that you see some value in testing, and so my goal here is to really drive you further down the path from, say, smoke tests or acceptance testing. Uh, as being you know, pretty much all of your testing, moving more down the path uh, to, to further isolate your code and move more towards uh, unit testing. So what is a unit test? A unit test is a test that doesn't require any parts of the larger system that it might otherwise interact with in order for the test to pass. It's very granular, meaning that you're only testing a very small piece of the code. It's isolated. And what falls out of that is that the feedback that you get from unit tests tends to be highly localized, such that if you have um, a unit, if you have a method that has an if block and a try accept block, right? You you already know you're probably going to write you know at least four unit tests for it, one where the if condition passes, one where it fails, one that triggers the accept block to run, and one that doesn't. And if you name that test test foo if passes accept triggered, and it fails. You probably know just from looking at that output within five lines of code where your problem is. So that's what I mean by localized. It's not a unit test if something outside of the code that you care about has to work in order for the test to pass. At that point, it's maybe at best a low level integration test. If you're testing the entire system, um, then I would call that, that, it, that has a lot of names out in the wild, acceptance test, QA testing, um, you know, spec testing, some people call it to see if uh, the functionality of this, the whole system uh, matches a spec. Uh, uh, and and it, for smaller, usually for small scripts and stuff like that, it's just called a smoke test. So let's define coverage. It's kind of a loaded term because the way that I hear it used a lot, you know, when I do, I do um, a lot of code reviews um, and I do, I read a lot of open source uh, software's source code. And you'll see sometimes in GitHub readmes, um, m maybe mine, um, I have 100% code coverage on this code. And it's, it's almost there as if it's supposed to be a selling point. And then you go and, and when I inspect the code further, what I find sometimes is that they really went for individual lines of code. I would assert that that is really not coverage. It's not really where you want to be, really. Where you want to be is you want to, you want to cover all of the conditions uh, that might surround the execution of that code. 
So you could call it case coverage or branch coverage, logic coverage, decision point coverage. But I think that's a, a totally separate thing and, and a much more valuable thing to uh, go after than individual lines of code. I use coverage.py. Um, I like it a lot. I recommend it. Uh, who has never heard of coverage.py? Okay. Well, it's, it's written by Ned Batchelder, and um, Ned's code is, is awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ned. So it integrates with nose tests. It is super duper duper easy to use. Um, I use it almost exclusively in the context of running nose tests as my uh, test discovery um, tool. And you can basically just say dash dash with coverage and, and you'll have coverage. And you can limit the scope of that coverage and, and do some nice things with that as well. It'll also output HTML output for you. Um, it's, it's very nice. And uh, you can even report on branch coverage using the dash dash branch flag. Um, there just seems to be nothing that this can't do. It can be used uh, pretty easily with Tox by itself uh, or from within nose tests. And uh, again, I want to say thanks to, to Ned Batchelder for that great work. So speaking of nose tests, um, it's, a, it's a great discovery tool. You actually can write unit tests. You can use nose tests as, your, um, as, as a unit test module replacement. Um, I haven't done it, but I've seen some tests that, uh, that use it. So you CD to your test directory and you can just run nose tests and it'll actually do something semi-intelligent with that. It'll discover your tests. There's a naming convention involved. If you start everything with just test underscore, that'll work. Um, you don't really need to look further than that, but you can if you want to change the regular expression it uses to identify tests, you can do that too. Um, but don't, just, just run nose tests and name yourself sanely. Nose tests with coverage, I already covered. Uh, coverage.py is a nose plugin. It has a super nice HTML report that will highlight um, sort of GitHub style. Um, it, it, the, the code printout kind of looks that, like similar to that. <coughs> and uh, it highlights the uncovered code in red, so that's nice. It also integrates well with Jenkins and it can provide you uh, HTML that integrates into the Jenkins interface pretty nicely. And there's um, a, um, a plugin called Nose X Cover that will uh, work with uh, Jenkins's uh, Kobatura style output, so you can get pretty graphs and um, you know managers like that. So check it out. Uh, so why unit tests at all? I, I'm actually asked this a whole lot, so I decided to cover it in the talk. Um, I, you know, I go around and I, I kind of go out of my way to to talk to people about unit testing because I still consider myself a student of of the uh, of the trade, and uh, I want to learn as much as I can. And one of the things I learned is that I'm completely backwards from everybody else who does any kind of testing at all in that. I seek to test everything starting with the most granular and working my way out. And it seems that everybody else starts with like a smoke test and then never goes anywhere else with it. Like there's tons of people that do, that's all they do is an acceptance level test. You know, I have a staging environment. My code has access to all the resources it could ever possibly want. And um, so, and I have great success testing in that environment. If something's wrong, I send it back to the development team. They spend the next three days figuring out where the actual problem is and then they put it back and they're ready to go. So unit tests by contrast are really fast and simple. And when I say fast and simple, yes, they run very quickly because they're uh, doing, they're only working on a very small, in a very small scope. But they're really easy just to do. Uh, I mean, so right before I got on the plane to come out here, it's a six hour flight from where I live. Um, I cloned a repository that had nothing but doc tests and I wrote all the tests that I need, all the unit tests for it, I wrote on the plane. And when I go back to push that to some other environment, I'll be able to run those tests again in whatever environment it goes in. Because you're creating, when you write a unit test, you're creating the entire uh, execution environment by mocking out any of the external dependencies that may not otherwise be there. So it becomes sort of like, you know, unit testing is sort of like my, my New York Times crossword puzzle. You know, some people do that on the plane, I, I write unit tests. <laughs> um, the other uh, reason is that, uh, that I like unit tests is that I, I really don't want to go searching through the code, right? I, I really don't want to have this huge system and get a trace back 
and then figure out where in the huge system the actual root cause is. Of course, you can find where, the actual, where things actually fail, but that's not typically the root cause. And then you're in charge of tracing everything back to where uh, the root cause is. I'd rather actually know uh, with a very low level of granularity where the problem is. Now, all that said, unit tests aren't enough. There's absolutely nothing wrong with um, smoke tests and acceptance testing and integration testing and all the other kinds of, of testing out there. Um, in fact, they're required, and so don't stop doing that because I don't have to do a talk next year on why you need a staging environment and all that stuff, and I, I don't know if I'm up for that. Um, specifically, unit tests, by definition, don't test integration. They don't test that individual parts work together because the only parts that it's working with are the parts that you've mocked out, right? You've created stand-ins for external dependencies, and, um, and, and that's what your code under test is talking to. So here's a problem with unit tests. I have this method. This is from PyRabbit. It's a module that I wrote to um, uh, provide a, a, a wrapper to RabbitMQ's HTTP management API. And this is a unit test. And uh, it tests that the, the code under test does what I expect it to do under the, the conditions that I set forward. But it's not an integration test. So if some part of the of the API or something in the HTTP.do call method, the signature changes or parts of the messages change on their, on their way back, the data changes on the way back, uh, like they, they change um, messages to depth, uh, then that's not going to be caught by this test. This test will still pass. So you still need integration tests, right? Like you were supposed to go back, yes, and edit your code and, and then update the tests and everything else, but you, you may not, and this test won't, may, may not catch all of the issues. So the solution is an integration test. It includes the um, HTTP client's do call method. So I didn't mock out that method. So it is going to be executed. So I'm actually testing that to some degree. And I'm also testing, don't forget, the instantiation of the HTTP client um, as well. And so this will actually call the do call method actually has like a JSON decode operation and stuff. But I am mocking out inside that call, there's a client request and I'm mocking that out. So I've moved my, I call it the reality distortion field, I've moved it out a level. So that now I, there are two pieces of the system code talking to each other, but now though that code's dependencies have been mocked out. Mock is cool, use it. Um, I, I really, um, this was a game changer for me because all of the libraries that I had ever used for unit testing uh, prior to using mock had all used a record replay uh, model of unit testing where you basically record how, the, how things are supposed to go and then replay them and um, it, it is, it, it, it flips the normal way you think about your code sort of upside down a little bit and, and I found it um, a little bit confusing and some tools are better at hiding it than others. I, I had some success. If, you're, if you want to compare um, uh, the MOX library, M-O-X, is one that I've had some success with uh, until I found MOC, at which point I just kind of like threw that on the ground and ran away and just used MOC. Uh, MOC uses a, uh, an action assertion model, which fits my brain much better because basically you, you, do, uh, you set up the conditions for the, for the execution environment, you execute the code, and you make assertions about, um, about the result. Uh, so we're gonna, see, we're gonna see a little bit of that. Uh, Mock also handles harder stuff. We're not gonna get into too much of it here because I really wanna uh, focus more on just getting over the hump and getting to where you can use these things. And some of that has to do with how your code is laid out and things like that. Um, but you can uh, make assertions about what methods on the mock object were called and with what arguments, which is, which is really nice. Uh, it, you can mock magic methods with writing really no code, uh, which is fantastic. And um, it puts objects back the way it found them um, after a test, which can really cause problems in unit tests if you, um, if you have sort of um, a state leakage between your tests. You can have tests that are passing, and they really shouldn't be passing, but because some state is leaking between your unit tests, uh, you'll get, or, or just vice versa, a test that should pass won't because state is leaking between your tests. And the reason it's leaking is because something that you patched was never put back the way it was, and so it still exists in that state. 
and your test is trying to use it in some way that is either mistakenly valid or mistakenly invalid. <clears throat> There's tons more. Note that this talk is really just a light intro. Okay, you should really check it out. So here's, uh, I have some code under test. And uh, when you're, this is the whole system. So what you're looking at now is if, if you have um, some code that's under test, uh, really you're testing the whole system. And so I wanted to illustrate the, how the uh, reality distortion field, the barrier that you create with your mock objects uh, affects how, how your tests um, are useful. So here we have, we're mocking out the, the bits of code that are closest to the code under test and uh, the mocks replace everything uh, starting from uh, the point closest to the code under test. And then we have, um, and then so, and that's where you get the most localization of your problems. Um, when you move out a level, these are basically low level integration tests. Now your uh, code under test is talking to bits that are, you know, quote unquote, one step away, but everything from there beyond has been mocked out. And so you get a little bit less localization, but you get a more thorough test of the integration of those parts. So there's still a lot of value in that. Uh, at this point, you're mocking out only the external resources like a database server, an HTTP server. Maybe you're mocking out uh, other remote resources as well, or even disk. Um, and uh, again, you know, if you started here, if this is where you're starting, you still have a lot of question marks. So um, if you're finding that uh, you're testing in this sort of mode and you still have a lot of question marks when, when things don't go quite right, you can move the reality distortion field back. And the way I do that is actually just by having separate modules that do unit testing versus integration testing and um, you know, maybe higher level integration testing in another module. And then finally you have your acceptance test where you're testing the entire system as a holistic system. So how do you get there though? Um, and how do you, how you get to be able to, you know, Part of the uh, resistance, I think, to moving from uh, a staging environment uh, more towards unit testing is that it does require a little bit deeper knowledge of the code. Um, it does require knowledge of some special techniques that you may not really need in a staging environment. And it, it is an investment in terms of learning how to, how to do it properly. And I think there's some resistance there, especially among managers that have large uh, developer bases that um, you know, don't want to make the investment to, uh, to train them all in unit testing. So you might find uh, using mocks difficult if your code is otherwise generally not doing the things that I'm about to tell you about. But if you do them, if you take the time to do these things, uh, your application code will be uh, better off for it in the long run. This is not done just for the sake of unit testing. It's done, it, it actually does improve your, your code. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit. These are things that I think are, are pretty simple to do um, without changing the API that your end users might eventually be using. So one is limiting the scope of responsibility. So you, if you have really long methods that uh, you know, are 75 lines long and um, they do everything soup to nuts inside them, uh, then breaking up the scope of responsibility is not only going to make your code more flexible and, and easier to refactor later, but it's also going to make it a whole lot easier to unit test. And it's going to um, probably reduce the, the amount of code, the number of external dependencies, and therefore you need fewer mocks and writing the test actually becomes really, really simple. I have lots and lots of uh, uh, unit tests that are really just four or five lines of code. It's very simple. And the mock library and other mock libraries too. Um, facilitate that. <clears throat> uh, I'm a huge advocate of creating local wrappers around things um, that talk to external resources. And um, this buys you a number of things, actually. One is just better encapsulation. If you're using URL lib today and you want to use HTTP lib tomorrow, you want to be able to change that out without changing the API and impacting your users. Um, so creating local wrappers is, uh, is definitely the way to go. And then um, deduplicating code, I think, is probably one that's pretty obvious until you actually go and find, uh, try, to, try to actually inspect your code to find duplicate code. Um, I would imagine that almost everyone in this room will, will find duplicate code somewhere in their code bases. Um, it, it is a, a difficult thing to abolish because in, in larger teams, there's multiple people working on the code base, and um, the way that things evolve is uh, something has to get out of the door right away and they say, okay, well, I'm just gonna cut and paste that over here. I'm gonna edit this one thing and then there you go, you have duplicate code. But it is typically pretty easy to fix. 
So let's look at an example. I have class foo. And in there is one method. It's not a very long method, but it's doing a lot of stuff. And we're going to apply um, these, three, these three things to fix this code up a little bit. So you have get path. Get path is using URL lib, which means that it's not only using URL lib to make the calls, it's also uh, dealing locally with the result object that's produced by URL lib URL open. So we'd like to create a wrapper around that so that when we, uh, if or when we decide that we don't like URL lib anymore, or we decide that something is easier to do with HTTP lib or URL lib 3 or something like that, we can just put that in our local wrapper. We can use multiple things in there and wrap it all up and still provide the same nice API for our end users. So um, local wrappers. Um, responsibility, we're doing, uh, we're doing the getting, we're doing the formatting, and we're doing the logging, right? So, um, this is really not the responsibility of this method. This message says it gets a path, and we're doing all kinds of other stuff inside of it. We have a little bit of code duplication, but it's com I'll, I'll admit it's completely concocted for the purpose of the talk. The, uh, the result assignment uh, assigns to string io. .string .io. I could have just moved it up in the method, um, but you know, we want, I wanted to make sure that I, that I hit all the, uh, all the pieces. So here's part of the solution. Um, here's my, my local wrapper for URL lib um, called HTTP client. It has one method, get, and that wraps my URL lib dependency. And what it returns is actually an instance of a wrapper that I created for the URL lib um, response object. So now, when we go back to class foo, we actually won't have any code either that makes calls or that deals with the response object that is dependent on URL lib or even references it at all. The result object, for its part, um, has methods that you can actually ask it for different representations of itself. So the whole formatting thing, um, you, you can either punt on it or you can leave it in there and just say, well, I'm just going to ask the result object for this and pass it on as a convenience to the user. And that's pretty much what I did here. So now in the initialization of the foo object, we instantiate a, uh, an HTTP client. And then get foo uh, leans on that HTTP client to get the path. And then if the format, we kept the formatting. We decided not to punt on that one. And if the format is test, text, it just says, you know, give me, give me the text version. Otherwise, give me the uh, JSON version and then return, return the result. We did punt on logging. Um, I decided that you know, if you were write, really writing a class like this, this class looks like it's something that's going to be used by other code. This is not end user code. This is code that is probably used by end user code. And really, the end user code should be in charge of logging, unless it's like debug logging, and they turn on logging.debug, and so your code should log along with everything else, and that's nice. But, um, but, but the code that we had there before was logging to a, uh, to a file, like it was doing manual logging by itself. So I actually just completely threw that out. And I would, at that point, I would say, you know, the user should really be logging this themselves. <coughs> so we're going to have another look at uh, a daytime abstraction library. And we'll look at a little bit how this works. This is, these are, uh, this is, um, a, this is a, a package called Time Machine. It's not on PyPy, but it's in GitHub slash BK Jones if you want to uh, take a look at the larger um, number. There's, there's a large number of methods. This is just a few um, representative samples from that. All it, 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 only has, it only imports two modules from the standard library. It's a wrapper around that. And it just does a bunch of date time manipulation stuff. I was doing some, I was writing a support module for uh, database reporting projects. Uh, so, you know, if you want to say, I, I, need, I need to report on every single month in the last three years, I need to pass to the database function the start and end date of each month in that, in that time frame. So I, I wanted to just wrap all that stuff because it's pretty ugly to do otherwise. So it's about 100 lines of code that's actually executable. Um, it's one module. It contains like just you know, one small, simple class called Time Machine. You do, just do from Time Machine, import Time Machine, and, and you're off and running. You instantiate it with no arguments. It's easy to use. It's only got two imports. It just wraps the functionality of date time and then a little bit of calendar. Um, and there are no third-party dependencies or external anything. 
Uh, it is tested, actually. I, I removed it from the listing over here um, just for readability. But it's actually tested using doc test. Uh, so, so the question there is, like, do you really refactor this to do unit tests? Like, it's got, it's, it's, it actually is tested. Uh, do I really need to go and create mocks and fakes and actually write a test.py with a unit test, test case, class, and all this other stuff? Uh, my answer to you would be yes. You need to do this. Um, and the reason is that, uh, I don't think I have a screenshot of this, but the, um, when you iterate over your code, you're going to add a test. Every time there's a regression, you're going to add a test to make sure that your code never falls prey to this problem again as you further iterate over the code. So you end up with possibly a whole bunch of these things. So, and, and so doc test's name implies that it should also serve something somewhat as documentation. And I think that after a while, this becomes rather unreadable. And there's lots of like special case little pragmas and stuff like that in doc tests that you also have to, to you know, bear in mind when you're reading the docs. And you have to know about that. So it's really not documentation unless you actually know how doc tests works. So, and, and the same is true to some degree for unit tests, but I feel like unit tests really provide just as good documentation, if, if, if not better, um, than doc tests after some period of time. I don't want to read that. I don't, you know, I don't, that's, I, I, want, I want named, I want things that have names so that, that, that give me some indication as to the, um, the conditions that are being applied. I want an assertion that clearly states what's being, what's, what it is that's being done, what makes this thing pass or fail. What makes it pass or fail is usually an assertion statement at the end. You know, I want these things. I don't want to have to sift through all of these things and figure out um, which condition I'm interested in and then see you know, how it's supposed to work. I just don't find it to be very intuitive to, to, to the reader. And this started out, obviously, as like just one doc test. And when you have one doc test, it's awesome. But uh, it grows over time, like I said. So um, this is part of what I did on the plane. Uh, now I have uh, a unit test test case. So if you haven't seen those before, that's what this is. This is how you create a, uh, a test case using the unit test module. It has a setup, which is uh, something that the unit test module actually knows what that is. And I instantiate a time machine object. Uh, I set a start date that I'm just going to use for the purpose of this test case. And then I have a, a test that says test previous by day. And I set, I set up my conditions in the, fir in the first two lines. So I, I set a day of week of Wednesday. It's going to be passed in as an argument to the code under test. Um, I, I uh, assign what I expect. Expect it as assigned to a daytime object that I'm expecting to get back after this code is run. I assign actual to uh, basically run the, run the code. And then I just do an assert equal to make sure that the expected is equal to the actual and my test passes. Uh, I'm following a rule here that not everybody follows, by the way, which is uh, one test, one assertion rule. Not everybody follows it. Um, I, I kind of recommend that you do follow it. You, you will write probably more unit tests as a result, um, but I think that your, your overall unit testing regime will be better off for it. You know, you're supposed to care for your unit tests in the same way that you care for your production code. And the result of not doing that typically results in some rot in the unit test code and some resulting rot in the, um, in the production code. And it's just a, a, a spiral, a downward spiral, and it turns into a big mess. So anyway, I think this is, this is actually way more readable. If I had one of, one of these uh, tests for each one of those, they would just be named uh, after the, the different conditions that are used to generate the, uh, the outcome. And I think that would be much more readable than, than reading all these doc tests. So let's look at a, a different uh, pattern, which is just a REST client module. I mean, there's tons of these out there. So these are, these are pretty popular things to have to write. And um, uh, like I said before, I wrote one called PyRabbit. It's on, it's, it actually is on PyPy, and it's also on Read the Docs, and it's uh, also on GitHub, BK Jones, PyRabbit. Um, it, <clears throat> it's a client for RabbitMQ's REST management API. It's about 250 lines of executable code. This is probably because I don't fully cover the entire gamut of the API. I cover probably about 80% of it. It has 200 lines of unit test code. Um, some of those unit tests, I'll, I'll admit, uh, are kind of cheating, and they're actually very low-level integration tests. And uh, it uses HTTP lib2 to talk to the actual uh, web server for the REST API. The reason I did that was because I wanted uh, Python 3 support. 
out of the box from, you know, I was writing this from scratch. Python 3 was out. Why would I, why would I create a module of these days without supporting Python 3 out of the box? Yeah. So, so I used HTTP lib2. The tests actually do pass. Uh, I test with uh, 2.6, 2.7, and 3.2. Uh, and I use Tox to test across the different versions. Um, and Tox is cool. You should use Tox. I'll do an aside right now. Uh, just to quickly tell you about Tox. What you're looking at is Tox's uh, config file for PyRabbit. And um, it's, it, the configuration is actually way easier than it even looks right here because uh, most of this stuff is stuff that Tox actually just tells you about in its documentation. So you have an env list. Those, uh, that list, that comma separated list there are all uh, names that uh, Tox knows about. So it's gonna tell you the environments that it supports. One of them is Py26, for example, so I put it in there. Then I set up a default test env. If there is no other um, qualifying uh, environment, then all of your environments will use this same configuration. So what Tox is gonna do is set up a virtual env. It's going to, um, in this case, install nose, HTTP lib2, and mock. It's gonna change the directory to the tests under the PyRabbit top level directory, and it's gonna run nodes tests with no arguments. I do have a special case though, because I use the unit test 2 module when I'm using Python 2.6. I also recommend that because the assert statements are actually way nicer and there are some other functionality uh, built into unit test 2. I believe that's where the new um, test discovery actually lives is in the unit test 2 module. Is that right? Thank you. Um, so there, there are a lot of features of that. So, and and it, it's been backported to uh, be supportable in 2.6. So um, go check that out. Uh, so in Python 2.6, I'm going to have to add a dependency to say you're going to also have to install the unit test 2 module. In, um, uh, in 3.2, you don't need that, and in 2.7, you also don't need that. And, and that's it. And then you run tox, and you literally you just, you know, you, in the directory where the tox.ini file lives, which in my case is in the top-level directory of PyRabbit, I just run tox, pip install tox, tox. And it says, okay, I'm building the environment for 2.6. I'm gonna run the test for that, and uh, here you go, passed, or, or it didn't. And then it's gonna do that again for 2.7, and it's gonna do that again for 3.2. And I actually broke something on the plane, so, um, so actually, normally it says, uh, success, congrats. Uh, but, but this one um, kind of makes a sad face at me right now. So I haven't pushed that code, though, so. This is what PyRabbit kind of looks like on the command line. Um, I should point out too that you actually don't need to do to use PyRabbit in this way. If you just want to like mess around with your RabbitMQ server, um, you can actually download another thing called BunnyQ that I wrote that uses PyRabbit. So it serves as an example code that uses PyRabbit, and it also is a, a command shell for interacting with it. Um, but these are just some examples. So this one just checks. You know, it creates the client object, checks that it's alive, creates a vhost, sets some permissions. Um, goes through and creates an exchange and a queue, binds the exchange and the queue together, uh, publishes a message, and then um, blows everything up. So destroys everything it creates. The, the, the overall model I've tried to make as simple as possible, and so I basically just have an HTTP client that's, that's, a, wrapped, that's a wrapper around HTTP lib2, and all of the um, code in the API module just calls the do call method of the HTTP client, passing in the uh, HTTP method name and the path. And as for the HTTP client module itself, it only has a main class, uh, which only has three methods, including init and uh, a couple of exception classes. So uh, the code is actually really simple and uh, I, it made it a lot easier to test. It didn't start out being very easy to test, but because I actually, I'm not doing pure test-driven development yet. Who's doing like pure test-driven development where you really don't write any code until this? Awesome. I'm, I'm so close to being there. Um, and uh, it, it's really fantastic, but I am iterating quickly enough between the uh, code that I'm writing and the tests that my tests still do have some time to inform my code's design. So um, that, that's been uh, really enlightening. So let's move on here. So I have a get connections um, <coughs> method inside the API module. The client.urls is, is a uh, class uh, dictionary that um, just maps names to the, the path on the API server that I want to call. Um, so that when the API changes a path, I just have to change it in one place. Any methods that use that just automatically work. Uh, 
Um, the connections are just, a, a, again, a call to do call, passing in the path and the HTTP method to use. And it just returns whatever it gets back. And if any exceptions are, are raised down there, then they actually just bubble up through this purposely. Here's the to call method I wanted to, we're gonna mock this out, so I wanted to show it to you before we mocked it out. The lines in red are things that um, catch my eye right away when I look at a, a method like this and I'm thinking about mocking it out. These represent uh, things that I'm probably going to test at some point. All right, so I'm gonna test that um, if, if this exception is thrown, that my, then my code under test actually handles that properly. Um, if it returns none, I'm gonna test that my code handles that properly. So everything that can possibly be returned to my code is actually going to be tested to verify that it handles the return properly. So here's my test. Only uh, the, I'll point out right now that only the top test is actually a unit test. The uh, bottom test, I think, would technically qualify as a low-level integration test because I do not mock out the HTTP client itself. I mock out the, um, the HTTP clients instance of HTTP libs client. It's, I, I mock its request method. <clears throat> so in the first one, um, I mock everything out, and, I t and I'm using the mock library here to create a mock object for self.client.http, and then the, uh, the do call method is a mock object, and I've set the return value to true. Now when we looked at the code earlier, we said that it's just going to make the do call method and return whatever it gets back. So if it gets back true, then this, this should just return true when I run it. So I have an assertion that says self assert true that when I run this, it returns true. So normally you might have to create like a whole mock thing over to the side to, to mock out your do call and you might have to you know, uh, you know, import more stuff into your unit test module and everything else. And really all I did was import mock and uh, assign a return value to a mock object. So if that mock object is called, it always returns that. And then I have a uh, test get connections and I'm saying um, that the request raises an exception. So the, you can see the response and content equals self client request. If that throws any kind of exception, uh, the do call method should uh, raise a network error because at this point in the execution of this code, I'm assuming that any, anything that goes wrong is related to the network, not the, uh, not the content or anything like that. <clears throat> and then I'm using, um, I think this was added in unit test two actually, the, uh, I'm using self assert raises uh, as a context manager. And I'm asserting that uh, what I'm about to do raises uh, a PyRabbit HTTP network error. And then I run self client get connections. And if that does not raise the, uh, oh, and I'm using mock using, uh, and I'm setting the side effect parameter uh, to my mock objects instantiation to be, the, um, to be the exception. And so that shows up over here, except exception is out. And then it should raise a network error, which I've accounted for here by saying assert raises network error. So we're almost out of time already. Um, a couple other tricks with, with uh, mocks. They're not really tricks. They're just things that uh, I think are, are made pretty easy. Um, one is mocking uh, standard output. Um, this is just something that you see quite often in cases where, like, for, the, uh, for anything that uses a CMD module, you might want to uh, mock standard out in order to perform unit tests to verify that, you know, I don't know, your opening prompt is right or something like that. So here I have something called print primes. And it's just a prime number, uh, prime number function, and um, and at the end it, it prints the prime numbers, and I give it uh, some input in the test. I give it some input. Uh, I I create a, a fake uh, output stream. I assign that to string I/O. I set the expected output, and then I use mocks um, patch method. I tell it to patch this standard out. I tell it to use outstream as the replacement for sys standard out, and I say call that out inside of this block. And then I do main print primes, and uh, I, I say that the, the actual output from that is going to be the uh, get value from the string IO object that I set as the output stream, which was used to replace sys standard out. And then I just assert that the actual out and the expected output are equal. <coughs> 
Um, testing decorated functions. Uh, this, is, this, this can be a minefield. I don't want to uh, make it seem like uh, it's always easy. It's not always easy, um, but uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be magical. Um, this is a needs admin privs. This exists in the PyRabbit module. So if it removes a lot of duplicate code, right? Because if, if I'm doing something that I know the API requires administrative privileges for, I don't really want to have to code that check into every module, that every method that needs it. So I just put a decorator on it. And then uh, you can see I'm using it here for the get users. If you're doing get users, it requires administrative privileges. So I just put that decorator on there. But now um, how, do I, how do I test this? And here's one way to do it. There's, there's actually multiple ways to do this. Um, you can patch api.client has admin rights, call it mock rights, and when get is called on that, um, mock will return false in this case because the name of the test is test get users no privs. So it should get some kind of error that says you don't have the sufficient privileges to, to perform this operation. Um, and then I'm, assert, I'm, a, I'm going to assert at the end that when I call self client get users, that it raises the PyRabbit API permissions error. So I've worked around the fact that it's um, a decorator and leaned more on what the decorator does. Uh, and it, it's, that's worked out pretty well. Um, what I've found harder, just so you know, and I don't, have, I don't have what I consider an elegant solution to this, I'm a, a big Tornado user. And um, I have not yet gotten around to figuring out an elegant solution for testing um, methods that are decorated with Tornado's asynchronous decorator. Um, so if anybody has a really elegant solution for that, I would love to know about that. So we've covered uh, what's a unit test? Why are they cool? Um, are unit tests all I need? They're not all you need. You need all kinds of tests. Unit tests are part of a complete breakfast. Uh, what's mock? Why is it cool? How can I use it? Use talks. Use nose tests. Use coverage. Um, we tested a simple, very one module data manipulation, uh, date manipulation library, and a REST API client library, and, uh, and some other stuff as well. So I hope that was useful in moving you forward. Um, at this point, I can take questions. This is, is this on? Yeah. Less of a question, more of a uh, announcement. So Michael Ford, the uh, mock creator, if you're uh, using Python 3, as you should be, in Python 3.3, we found out in the uh, language summit on, on Wednesday that mock is not going to be in the standard library as unit test.mock in Python 3.3. So That's awesome. Thanks, Brian. Hi. Hi. I wondered if you had any uh, words to say on um, Organizing unit tests is really easy. You can set up a one-to-one -one correspondence with the unit tests. I'm sorry, could you, could you speak up a little bit? Sorry, yeah. Organizing unit tests is really easy. You can uh, set up a one-to-one -one with the, the module under test and the, the unit test module itself. Um, do you have any words of wisdom on how you organize your integration tests? Because there isn't that clear one-to-one -one correspondence in my mind. Um, it's an iterative process. Uh, the, the question is, how do you organize your integration tests when integration tests really don't um, uh, there isn't a one-to-one -one thing, like you said, between, you know, when you're writing unit tests, you have your unit test and you have the unit test module and everything's pretty clean. When you do integration tests, where you're setting your reality distortion field isn't a consistent thing. And so how do you organize this in, in a way that um, you say, you know, um, I'm testing now, um, I'm, uh, you know, how, how do you organize it so that you say you're setting the barrier here and now I'm setting the barrier here. And I, I try to do that with different modules. Um, the reality is that it's an iterative process. And I say that because um, uh, I, I sometimes find that I, th I think I'm writing unit tests and I, and I mistakenly write a very low level integration test. I've forgotten to mock something out and it, it actually becomes an integration test. Then when I go and create my integration test, I find myself basically writing the same test. And <laughs> so I move it over and it's iterative. And, they, and then when I want to move the distortion field out another level, um, in some cases, it's actually really straightforward, right? Like for something like PyRabbit, it's actually pretty straightforward. For something like an entire website, it, it, is, it is hairy. And um, um, all I can tell you is, is that what I do is I, I, I wind up creating more files. And then if I can, if I can merge them later, I will. If there's, if there's a clear line, if I can define a clear line, um, then, I'll, then I'll merge them all together. But I try to, and the files to me represent the, the, the placement of the, of the barrier, 
And if I find later that, well, these two things are really placing the barrier in the same place, I'll put them together, but it's completely iterative. You mentioned a bunch of the problems with doc tests, mm -hmm. but you still, in your module, you would use doc tests initially. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, when do you find doc tests appropriate? Like, when do you turn to them? Because we've basically stopped writing doc tests only. Unit tests. Me too. I stopped. Okay. Uh, the, the question is, when do you find doc tests um, useful? Uh, when would you use doc tests? And, and I don't want to knock doc tests. I mean, for, for what it does, it, it does a great job. It does what it says it does. But um, I, I don't use doc tests uh, really. Uh, at all anymore. In fact, uh, Time Machine was my introduction, first use, and last use of doc tests. And uh, I'm not, I don't want to say that to knock doc tests at all um, because it works. But um, for what I'm going after in my tests, I, I, I don't really see a place for it. I don't count it out. I'll still consider it. If I think that there's a use for it, I'll use it. But I can't, I, I just don't foresee that happening myself. Embedding source, in documentation. embedding source in documentation. But then, but then, yeah, I, yeah, I, I could see that. Uh, so if you want to embed, um, you know, a, a command line interpreter session inside of your documentation for Sphinx output, um, that would be good. Although I would say that um, a lot of times I'm writing code that other code is going to use. If I was writing end user code, I'd probably do that. But I'm usually writing code that other code is going to use, in which case, if I'm going to embed code in my Sphinx documentation, I'm probably going to embed actual code. Um, so, and at that point, um, if all you want to do is put the interpreter session in, I'm just going to cut and paste it in there, and it's only, it's only really a doc test by coincidence, right? Yeah, it's had a general question about designing for testability. Um, so a lot, I see a lot of the way that testing is written in Python. It's kind of reliant on the fact that you have this clever ability to do monkey patching and, and modification of different modules at runtime. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on, on readability in code versus um, taking an approach where you get dependencies passed to you versus calling out to them implicitly in your code and relying on this monkey patching at runtime to make the testing mock it out. So you're talking about dependency injections specifically? Yeah, basically. Okay, so my, my thoughts on dependency injection are that I actually use it in a lot of cases to, um, uh, to a lot of times to remove code duplication, um, <clears throat> but it's sort of coincidental. Um, for to do dependency injection on a larger scale, um, in, in my, ex my own experience, I'm usually working with a team of developers and, and it's something that everybody has to be on board for, otherwise people are gonna have a really difficult time getting over the hump and reading your code at all. So um, it, it requires everybody to kind of be on board with that because it, it does flip some things upside down and makes the code less readable if you're not familiar with the technique, right? Um, and so in that case, it can make the code less readable if you're in an environment where dependency injection is not the norm. Um, but for my own code, I have absolutely no problem using it, um, but I, I admittedly don't use it everywhere because it's not uh, the, the natural mode my brain thinks in until I get to a point where it's like, this needs to end. <laughs> and, and then the solution I come up with is, is, so dependency injection to me is a solution to a problem. It's not something that I, I, uh, that I come across in my, in my top-down design very often unless I'm able to foresee the problem. Uh, that leads wonderfully into my comment, and I'll keep it short because it is a comment, which is that your problem with decorators is because the decorators couple things together at effectively compile time. Um, you can't split them apart anymore. And the solution to that is basically dependency injection. Right. You want to define your, your method, and then if you can, you want to wrap it with the decorator in another method where it's actually being used, rather than wrapping it at definition time, which means you're not using the syntax, but you can still use the decorators. Um, I just know it's a common problem, so I wanted to present Thanks a lot a for solution. that. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Um, so he's saying that the, um, the problem that I have, that I mentioned, that I have with decorators um, is that uh, you can't split them apart because decorators are something I've applied at runtime, and you can't split them apart after runtime. You can't perform a unit test that way. So uh, the, the solution to that problem is actually dependency injection, um, which is a, actually a, a really good point, and I can already imagine um, places where I might be able to, 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 to use that. So thank you. <laughs>